Many people today believe that our universe is nothing more than a byproduct of tiny atoms bounced around in an empty void and everything else emerges from that. However, this materialistic picture of reality is fading away and a new picture of reality is needed to replace materialism. I will argue in this video that, that given recent discoveries in quantum cosmology and the nature of space-time, that the best explanation is the metaphysics of idealism. The two major theories that exist today in physics are quantum mechanics and general relativity. Quantum physics describes the very small, while general relativity describes the very large. Given their great explanatory power and explaining reality, these two theories remain incompatible with each other. Furthermore, these theories treat time very differently, and they run on very different rules. However, there are some recent ideas that have been developed in physics which do make these theories come together. One such idea is the holographic principle, a theory which suggests that our entire three-dimensional universe can be seen as two-dimensional information. So, the whole universe and the particles that make up reality would actually emerge from underlying information that isn't located anywhere in our three-dimensional space-time universe. This idea was meant as a way to try and explain the physics of black holes and how matter can be condensed into black holes. Now, the holographic principle was only an idea at first, but then in 2017 this changed when a study confirmed evidence for the holographic principle. The holographic model was compared to the standard model, and the study found that it was a better model than the standard model mainly by making non propagative predictions for large angle statistics of the cosmic micro background radiation. This means that the universe we experience would emerge from the quantum realm. Furthermore, a later study found that entanglement was an inevitable future of any theory which supersedes classical physics. Entanglement happens when two particles interact in a way where their quantum states cannot be described independently. However, if you separate them by a great distance, an effect on wood should have an effect on the other, regardless of the space between them. So spooky action at a distance was Einstein's kind of appellation for the idea of non-locality. Non-locality is the more technical term for it. And what it means is that there's a connection between different objects or places in the universe. There's some kind of link or bond between particles or places or just objects in general that can be quite far apart from one another. In principle, they could be on the other side of the universe even. And the natural world is filled with connections of different sorts. That's really what science is all about, making sense of those connections. But what's unusual about these connections is there doesn't seem to be a connector. There's no mechanism that actually relates the object in one place to the object in the other. And yet those objects still act in unison. They're able to coordinate what they do. But now I think the progress of science and of understanding of the nature of space and time have taken us to a possible explanation. So if you think of those two coins, they're on opposite sides of the universe or their continent or wherever they may be, but they act as though they're right next to one another. They act as though they're kind of nuzzled up together. So they, they, they don't seem to have any distance between them. They're acting as though there's no distance between them, although in, you go measure the distance, it's enormous. So the proposition is that the distance between them is somehow an illusion. It's somehow a kind of a mirage. Or maybe a better way of putting it, it's a construction. That those, there's, those particles or those coins in the metaphor are rooted in a layer of reality where the distance doesn't seem to exist. They, they, they're juxtaposed, even they look like they're far apart. And the distance is real to us. So it's real at our level of reality but it's not real to the particles. So the idea is that the concept of space, of distance, all the spatial concepts we deal with in science are emerging from that deeper level. They're not fundamental in the world. They're derivative. This means that the information between two entangled particles are not located in space. This implies that space is not fundamental, but rather emerges from a deeper layer of reality. Whereas space is just obviously not fundamental. <laughs> space is something where when you, when you go from classical mechanics to quantum mechanics, space more or less disappears. You know, in classical mechanics, what do you have? Some particles moving through space with some velocity. In quantum mechanics, you have a wave function of all those particles. And that wave function, we tend to talk a language that the wave function 
is a function of all the particles and their locations in space, but we don't have to talk that language. We can use what is called the momentum space description. We can completely describe the particles by how fast they're moving instead of where they are in the universe. And for that matter, we don't need to use any description at all. We can just use these quantum mechanical states in their own right, with no reference to space whatsoever. In quantum mechanics prior to measurement, particles have no defined properties or locations. They simply exist as a wave function of possible states they could take. This includes the space they take up. So space emerges only after measurement. So both the holographic principle and entanglement show that space is not fundamental to reality. Space is the illusion that particles are separated, not a fundamental future of reality. Physicist Han Yang says that emergent space-time is a new fundamental paradigm from quantum gravity. However, it is not just space that emerges. Under Einstein's theory of general, general relativity, space and time are one. So then, that would mean that time is also from the quantum world. And an experiment from 2013 illustrates that time is also an emergent construct of entanglement. This all implies that everything we experience, which is tiny atoms bouncing around in space-time, are not fundamental to reality, but come from a deeper layer of reality, as Sean Carroll explains. Mathematically, wave functions are elements of mathematical structures called Hilbert space. This means that they are vectors. We can add quantum states together and calculate the angle between them. The word space in Hilbert space doesn't mean the good old three-dimensional space-time we walk through every day or even the four-dimensional space-time relativity. It's just mass speak for a collection of things, in this case, possible quantum states of the universe. So, this deeper level of reality from which our classical world emerges from is called Herbert space. Thus, our universe emerges from Herbert space. Adding on to this, Brian Whitworth looked at things in our universe and compared them to what we would expect in a virtual or emergent world. He found key 11 futures to the universe that are better explained by the idea that we live in a virtual or emergent reality instead of a fundamental reality with space, time, and matter. Things in our universe like the maximum speed, quantum tunneling, and wave function collapse all make sense in an emergent reality rather than a fundamental reality. So this would only add on to the evidence we already discussed earlier. However, given this evidence, there is a much more serious and deeper implication. While the wave function of Hilbert space explains the emergence of space-time, the same quantum processes have been shown in conscious thought processes. Quantum superpositions act very similar to how we think. When choosing between different options, for example, we will hold conflicting opinions until a final decision is met. This is what is known as quantum cognition, and there is a lot of new research into this field. Some may try to avoid this by saying that the brain is still classically computing, while it only appears to be quantum. However, this would face what's called the qubit unpacking problem. Trying to simulate a quantum bit from classical bits would create exponential slowdown since they would all need to unpack into classical bits. Furthermore, the idea that our thoughts are in Herbert space also correlates with an intuition that we can't find our mental thoughts anywhere in space-time. When we think of a zebra, for example, we can't find the thought of a zebra anywhere in our space-time domain, which can only mean that it exists in Hilbert space. As we went over in our previous video, the classical world we experience would be created from the interaction between our mental states and the external world of information. However, in both cases, they are non-physical and thus exist in Hilbert space. The space-time that we experience would only exist in our perceptions. A recent study published by Matthew Fisher shows the effects of quantum cognition. I shall now let Johan and Ratz explain. Groups of rats given lithium-6 and lithium-7 isotopes respectively demonstrated markedly different cognitive behaviors. The group given lithium-6 showed much stronger maternal instincts, such as nest building, than the group given lithium-7. So what this experiment did is it took, uh, you know, something like 24 female rats, divided them into four groups, lithium-6 to one group in that drinking water, a lithium-7, you know, naturally occurring lithium, which is essentially lithium-7, and the control rats for 10 days. Then they impregnated these 24 female rats, undoped males, I don't think it's important. Um, and for during the 20 day gestation period, as the pups grew inside, they continued to feed them lithium-6, lithium-7, and the control rats, they gave birth to the pups. And what they were looking at and reported in this table is the uh, mothering behavior of the, of the rats. And they were looking at things like nest building, nursing, grooming of pups, retrieval of pups, when they take the pups away, how most of the mothers uh, grab the pups back. 
grooming of self, reaching for food, state of alertness, and so forth. Now, the control rats were average in everything. It's kind of amazing, huh? Are you suspicious? Is this blind, double blind, triple blind, or not blind at all? I don't know. It was done at the Cornell University Medical School, so, you know. It's a, uh, but let's look at the uh, naturally occurring lithium, which is essentially lithium-7 and the 99% lithium-7. Uh, so nest building absent, well, that means something. Uh, nursing infrequent short duration, grooming of pups infrequent, retrieval of pups infrequent, grooming of self-absent. State of alertness low. Okay, well, so that's consistent with my own experience and experience of others that have taken lithium. You take high doses, you are less alert. There's no question about it. So maybe this makes sense. But what about lithium-6? Okay, so lithium-6 is the normally 8%, but these rats were given the lithium-6 rats, 95% uh, uh, lithium-6. And the re re results were just too unbelievable to, for me to believe. Uh, nest building was excessive. Well, they built a lot of nests. Nursing was very frequent, long duration. A retrieval of pups, I like this, excessive. Well, <laughs> you know, these were helicopter rats. You know, what can you say? They were, these were the safe pups, so. Um, okay, the one that really caught my attention was a state of alertness, very high. However, given that they were given the same element with the same chemical properties, if the rat's cognitive behavior were only determined by simple electrochemical processes, this should not be. The only difference between lithium-6 and lithium-7 is a single neutron, which adds to the total mass of the isotope and thereby alters its quantum vibration frequency, and not its chemical behavior. Thus the cognitive behavior driving the rat's maternal instincts was influenced not by chemical processes, but by a change in the quantum states of the lithium-6 they ingested. Feed lithium-6 to some rats, lithium-7 to some rats, have some control rats, and look for any differences in behavior. Are there any behavioral manifestations uh, which might be uh, uh, present? It seemed like a completely crazy idea. How could that possibly be? Because the chemistry should basically be identical. The chemistry is determined by the number of electrons. Lithium-6 and lithium-7 have the same number of electrons, of course. How on earth could this possibly be that the two isotopes of lithium have an opposite effect on the sign of the mood of these uh, female rats? Well, okay, there's a re mass ratio of 7 to 6, not so big, um, but what's remarkable is the nuclear spin entanglement time. I showed you this uh, 10 seconds, well it turns out that for li that's for lithium-7, lithium-6 is 5 minutes. I don't know about you, but my memory is much, not much longer than 5 minutes, and when I saw that I was like, good lord, could it really be that evolution had you know, undergone the uh, process where nuclear spins you know, became um, qubits in a quantum processing uh, in the brain and that our brains are some sort of quantum computer. Drawing from this clue, Fisher proposed that similar quantum biology in the human brain lies in the Posner molecule, the quantum spins of which can remain stable for hours at a time, even in the environment of the brain, long enough to correlate to normal synaptic activity. If this is the case, however, then our inner cognitive processes, our thoughts and feelings, lay outside of our ordinary space, existing as quantum states, in the non-physical Hilbert space behind space-time. Curiously though, this also neatly matches a very ordinary intuition we have about our thoughts. If we stop to reflect on the nature of our thoughts for a moment, it is clear they are very real things, and yet they retain a platonic existence and do not occupy space or time. With all this to take into account, it's clear that since we can model conscious thought processes as existing in Hilbert space, given the evidence from quantum cognition, and if space-time is emergent from Hilbert space, then, when combining quantum cognition with emergent space-time, the most parsimonious explanation is that space-time emerges from consciousness. This only correlates with the idealist views of philosophy of mind. It does not matter that it is fundamental and the mind emergent, rather, the mind is fundamental, and the experience of the physical world is what is created from the mind. It is not the blind workings of matter that create our world. Rather, the blind workings of matter are produced from the mind, and universal consciousness is what created our universe. Think of what we experience. It is a world of qualia. Everything that we experience can be described in terms of mental events, without any separate physical substance that is outside consciousness. We can explain our physical world in terms of mental properties, and this only confirms idealism. Furthermore, in a recent study, researchers found interesting similarities between brain networks 
in the cosmic web of galaxies. Is this apparent similarity just the human tendency to perceive multiple patterns in random data? Remarkably enough, the answer seems to be no. Statistical analysis shows that these systems do indeed present quantitative similarities. Researchers regularly use a technique called power spectrum analysis to study the large scale distribution of galaxies. The power spectrum is an image that measures the strength of structural fluctuations belonging to a specific spatial stage. In other words, it tells us how many high frequency and low frequency notes make the peculiar spatial method in each image. This would mean that the similarities between brain networks and the cosmic world of galaxies is not just a coincidence. If idealism is true, then this is exactly what we would expect. Both the cosmos and the brain form a similar structure because our brains are the extrinsic appearance of our conscious inner life, in the same way that the entire universe is the extrinsic appearance of universal consciousness. So, with this direct scientific evidence for idealism, there is simply no reason to accept a reality beyond consciousness, because when we combine all this data, the evidence is clear. Our universe is created from universal consciousness, and so there is no reason to accept a reality beyond this universal consciousness.